And welcome back to the Cloud Church. I am Robert Breaker, Missionary Evangelist to the Spanish and English speaking people. Last time, as we were going through our verse by verse Bible study through the epistles of Paul in order of when they were written, we finished up chapter 13, probably one of my least favorite chapters in the Bible because it talks about submitting to the government. Many people twist that passage, take it out of context, tell you whatever the government says you have to do, yet they fail to read the rest of the Bible. There are some conditions. When the government is just and righteous and good, that's when we submit. But when it goes against God in the Bible and forces you to sin against your own conscience, that's when we must resist. That's when we must stand. That's when we must put on the armor of light and say, No! I cannot be partaker of your sins. And that's when we're supposed to uh, get away from it and um, resist the powers that be. Sure, they are ordained of God. God ordains them. But God does not ordain them to do evil. God has ordained them to do good. So I'm so thankful that chapter 13 is over. Well, now we come to chapter 14. In chapter 14, Paul starts talking about what, what one pastor said, some guidelines about some gray areas in the Christian life. And there are a lot of good things here in Romans chapter 14, a lot of interesting things. But toward the end, we get some interesting um, stories as well. We need to remember that as we're going through these epistles of Paul, that's what they are, epistles. Epistles mean letters. And so when Paul is writing his epistles, they're, they're just letters he's writing to a group or to a church or to a certain people. And a lot of times, it's not his first letter that he's written to them. Often, they have written him something first, asking questions, and then he answers in his epistle. So what it seems like here in chapter 14 is that they had asked Paul, what about meat sacrificed to idols? Now, as we went through 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, we looked at this and how Paul says we're not supposed to uh, eat meat sacrificed to idols unless we sanctify it first by the word of God in prayer. In other words, we pray over it, and then we can eat it. But then if it makes your brother offend, or if it offends someone, then we don't eat it because we don't want to offend the weaker brother who might say, but that's been sacrificed to an idol. Oh, it's not right to eat that. Oh, okay. Well, if it pricks your conscience to eat it, even though I know it's nothing the idol is. Paul says the idol is nothing. And all I can do is just say, God, sanctify this, take the, the idol curse off of it or whatever, bless it in the nurse of my body. I can eat it knowing that I'm a strong Christian, that the nothing's going to happen to me. But weaker Christians might look at that and say, oh, you shouldn't do that. So Paul deals with that, but again he deals with it in Romans 14, and we'll see that toward the end of the chapter. So let's begin here in Romans chapter 14 and verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful dispensations. Now, again, a weak Christian. Some Christians, as soon as they get saved, they don't know any Bible. All they know is, Jesus saved me, and I'm supposed to live right, and live pure, live clean, and do right. And so when an older Christian does something that they don't understand, it's easy for them to go, well, then you're not a Christian because that doesn't seem Christian. And so you have to explain it. So there are weaker brothers, weaker in the faith. And what are you supposed to do? Well, the Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to take that weaker Christian who's weaker in the faith and say, let me teach you some stuff. Let me show you what the Bible says. Don't give them opinions. Give them Scripture. So Paul is saying, if there's someone that's weak in the faith, you receive them, but not to doubtful dispensations. When you're a Christian, you shouldn't live on the borderline and say, well, I can do this if I want. Grace is not an excuse to sin. There are some things that as a Christian we can do, but we shouldn't do because it might affect other Christians. So there are some things. For example, a guy called me the other night and says, what does the Bible say about drinking? Because I like to drink. He said, is it a sin to drink alcohol? And I, I wanted to say, yes, yes it is. But then I thought, well, in Timothy, it says, have a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So the Bible says the sin is getting drunk. But the Bible also says abstain from all appearance of evil. So yes, there is an allowance that you as a Christian can drink some alcohol, usually when you're sick. For me, I'll give you an example. When I was a child, this was before I was even saved, 
My, I was sick as a dog with a cough and a fever. And I remember my grandmother gave me a little shot glass. And she said, drink it and you'll feel better tomorrow. And I was like, what is it? She said, it's a shot of whiskey with lemon and honey. And I drank that and I don't like alcohol. It's disgusting. But you know what? I fell right asleep. I woke up feeling way better in the morning. Just like the Bible says, a little wine for thy stomach's sake and then often infirmities. As medicine, it's okay to drink a little alcohol. You might be a Christian, you might say, I don't believe that, I don't believe that, I don't believe that. Okay, you're weaker in the faith, and I don't want to receive you into doubtful dispensations, but let me just say this. Have you ever had NyQuil? Hmm? Do you know what NyQuil is? It's 10% alcohol. So don't pull that holier-than-me junk and say, well, I don't drink, when you have a NyQuil every time you get sick. So, if a guy gets saved, I've, I've known Christians that say, well, I can drink anytime I want, as long as I don't get drunk. And so they drink beer and liquor, and, I, and it's, not, it's not good for your testimony if other people see you do that. Matter of fact, it's not something that God likes. The Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. So, what if somebody comes over to your house that's a Christian, and they see you drinking a beer? What are they going to think? Well... It doesn't mean you're saved or not, but they'll probably think, well, I wonder if he's saved, he's drinking a beer. Is it wrong to drink a beer? The world does it, and the Bible says we're supposed to be out of the world and not in the world. So there are some things that we as a Christian can do, but the question is, should we do it? Because it might offend a weaker brother. So the best thing to do is stay away from it. I've known men that say, well, I, I love to drink beer. It, but I can't help but get drunk. All right, then you're sinning. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, look not in the wine, uh, the cup, when it moves itself aright. And uh, you're not even supposed to look at it. And there are people that take that verse and say, see, you can't have any NyQuil. You've got to have the right balance. But the best balance is abstain from all appearance of evil. If it appears evil to drink alcohol, then don't drink any alcohol. Paul said, I become all things for all men that I might win some. I would imagine Paul never had alcohol a day in his life, and if he did, it was a very little bit when he was sick as medicine, because that's what he recommended it for. So, there are things that we can do as a Christian, and even though it may not be sin, it is to other Christians. One thing I've learned in the ministry is that in America, because of prohibition and all that stuff, Billy Sunday helped start prohibition, preaching against liquor, which... You know, that's great. Liquor can harm a lot of people. But uh, Billy Sunday preached against that. And in America today, many Christians believe if you drink alcohol, that's a sin against God. Well, you go right across the pond, go right across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe. You'll find Christian after Christian after Christian after Christian. And many of them laugh if you say you can't drink wine, you can't drink alcohol, you can't drink beer. Most of these Christians grew up all their lives drinking it. They never got drunk. But they drink it with a meal. And they look at America and they say, how stupid they are. They say, we can't drink. Boy, we grew up drinking. So is it a sin? Well, that's something you've got to figure out for yourself. Because that's what this chapter is dealing with. Something that one Christian might look at as, oh, this isn't wrong. But another Christian look at it as, yes, it is. And so if we offend them and make that brother to stumble, then we shouldn't do it. So that's what chapter 14 is talking about. So the sin is getting drunk. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Well, if the sin is getting drunk, then why drink? Because that can lead to drunkenness. You know, if the sin is fornication, then why go kiss a girl and touch her all over when that can lead to fornication? So don't even start. Get married. Have your own wife and do that. So there are things that some Christians look at dogmatically as sin, and some Christians don't. And both of them have scripture. This guy over here says, Be not drunk with wine, where is an excess? The Bible says, Don't even look at the wine in the cup. It's sin to drink alcohol. This Christian says, No, it's not. It's a sin to get drunk. And the Bible even says, Drink some when you're sick. So you see how you, you can get two people on either side? So what do we need to do? Well, Paul is saying here, as we see in this chapter, Think about the other brother and don't offend him, as we've seen in other passages. So, him that is weak in the faith, receive you, but not to doubtful dispensations. A guy gets saved, don't make him doubt certain things. Try to show him the right way. 
Verse 2, For one believeth that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. So here we have this set up. Some sound like they only eat herbs, or like vegetarian, if you will, and others eat meat. Okay, so it seems like the people in Rome asked Paul, is it okay for us to eat meat, or should we only eat herbs? So Paul is writing, and he's saying, well, this group says, no meat, no meat, no meat, it's sin to eat meat, and only eat herbs, and this group says it's okay to eat meat. He says, let not him that eateth meat despise him which doesn't. So there should be no contention. What these people do in their own home, if they don't want to eat meat, that's between them and the Lord. If they're Christians, I love them, they love me. But they should not come to me, who likes to eat ribeye steaks, and say, it's a sin for you to eat ribeye steaks, and attack me. No. Where in the Bible does it say you can or can't eat meat? Well, I've made a video about that, what the Bible says about eating meat. If you get a chance, check that one out. Because today, we are seeing this exact same thing taking place. There are some people on YouTube that are putting out videos saying it's a sin for a Christian to eat meat. And they are as wrong as a man can be. In the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit brings down to Peter a vision of certain animals that once under the law were unclean. And God says, kill and eat. Because God says you can eat these things. So it's not sin to eat meat. <clears throat> so, in other words, don't, as Christians, divide a line and say, well, I'm on this side, you're on that side, and fight each other. You see, Christians are supposed to have the same mind. So there might be some Christians who their own conviction is, I can't eat meat. Okay, well, I shouldn't attack them. I should say, amen, brother, I love you. I'll invite you over to my house for dinner. What are you having? Oh, we're going to cook some hamburgers. Well, I can't come. Oh, no, no, it's okay, brother. For you, I went and bought some vegan burgers that are, you know, 100% uh, black bean burger or something. You see, you can get along as Christians, and you should, even if other Christians don't have the same convictions as you do. So verse 3, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. So both are saved, even though they have different ideas on certain things. Now, if the idea that someone has is, is blatantly anti-biblical, then yes, yes, you should talk to them and get them right. But like I said in the beginning of this, these are some certain gray areas in the church. There are some things that the Bible doesn't tell us is right or wrong. So should we do it? Like, for example, riding a motorcycle. Oh no, I hope I don't offend anybody here. But my daddy always taught me since I was a kid, never ever ride a motorcycle because you'll get hurt. Well, I was about 12 years old and at my uncle's house and he had a little moped. A little, well it was actually a little dirt bike. And in the back of my head, my dad's voice was saying, don't ride the dirt bike, don't ride the dirt And I said, Uncle, can I ride that? Sure. He started up for me, and I rode the dirt bike, had the time of my life, until it ran out of gas. And guess what? I had to push it back almost a mile, and I still have the burn on the side of my leg from the muffler, where I let it rest up against my leg, and made a burn that big. Daddy was right, don't ride a motorcycle, or you'll hurt yourself. That wasn't the only time in my life I rode a motorcycle. I rode a motorcycle again, a moped, and guess what? I wrecked it. Hurt my leg. I did it again in Honduras, and guess what? I fell and hurt my ankle. There were some things that my daddy taught me were wrong, and I should have listened. I'd be in better health today. Now, is it sin to ride a motorcycle? No. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, do not ride a motorcycle. But, for me, it's something that I don't want to do or have my children do, because I don't want to see them get hurt. And it is very, very easy to get hurt on a motorcycle. In fact, everyone I've ever talked to, that's the first thing I ask them, will you ever have an accident? And if they're, everyone I've ever talked to that used a motorcycle, I say, you ever have, yes. I've yet to find one person that rides a motorcycle that's ever told me, no, nope, never had an accident, not once in my entire life, on a motorcycle. So, what am I going to do? Am I going to start my anti-motorcycle church? And you can't fellowship with me if you're, no. If you ride a motorcycle, that's your business. That's between you and the Lord. For me and my own, our conviction is stay as far away from those things as possible. Yes, they're fun. I used to call them a crotch rocket. They're fun. It's fun to go fast. But it's not fun when you fall. <laughs> and it could have been avoided. 
if you were more careful. So I'm not preaching against motorcycles. If you've got a motorcycle, praise God, have fun, just be careful. But for me, that's not something that I want. So I want to obey the Bible. The Bible doesn't say anything about that, so you do your thing, I'll do mine. I, thanks, but no thanks, I don't want to ride on a motorcycle. Now it says here, verse 4, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. So we have, uh, first of all, the, the, the eating of herbs, the vegan versus meat controversy. Next, in verse 4, it's something about a man judging another man's servant. Now, is that still the context of verse 3 about the servant not wanting to eat meat? I don't know. It was something they wrote to him about, about judging a servant. But then in verse 5, we get a, uh, another thing. It says, One man esteemeth day, one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So here we have another division. There's some people within the church that say, well, we esteem this day, and others say, no, we esteem this day. What are they esteeming it for? I don't know. But it says in verse 6, He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So he ties all these things together. And he ties it together. So first of all, someone is taking a certain day and saying, I'm remembering this day for the Lord. And someone is taking another day and saying, but we remember this day for the Lord. Now I don't know, but a lot of times people who preach that church should be on Sunday, or Saturday and not Sunday, I like to take them to this verse. Here's the Apostle Paul, and he's saying, if you're regarding it unto the Lord, then regard it. And we're not supposed to judge a person. Now, there are many people out there call themselves Seventh-day Adventists that will attack you if you go to church on Sunday. They believe that church is only on Saturday. And they are so confused, they don't know their head from their rear end, unfortunately, because they don't understand. Most Seventh-day Adventists tell us that we are still under this. But we're not. We're in the New Testament. We're not under the Old Testament, yet they try to force you to be. We're under the church age... And under the church age, Jesus Christ rose again on guess which day? Sunday. And as you read through the book of Acts, you find a recurring theme that all throughout the book of Acts, the early church is meeting on Sunday. Well, over here, they met on Saturday. So there are Seventh-day Adventists that tell you you have to keep the Sabbath day, the sixth day, or the, yeah, the uh, last day. You have to keep that day. Is it the seventh day? It's the last day, so it must be the seventh day. You've got to keep the seventh day, which is what? Saturday. Well, we as Christians, from the early book of Acts, and because Jesus rose on Sunday, we always celebrate church on Sunday. Now, what does Paul say? He says, who cares? As long as you're regarding it to the Lord, that's all that matters. Well, I wish it were that simple. You see, this crowd over here, says it's the mark of the beast if you go to church on Sunday. Now that's utterly ridiculous. I've never heard something more stupid in my entire life. The mark of the beast is a literal mark that goes in your right hand and, and or your forehead. How can going to church be a mark of the beast? Makes no sense to me. So the things that Paul was dealing with in his ministry, we're still dealing with today. And unfortunately, I've yet to meet a Seventh-day Adventist yet that I think is saved. Because they're all thinking that they have to do some sort of work to get to heaven. And they're not trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So if you're Seventh-day Adventist and you're watching this, I hope you get saved. I hope you realize the Bible says that Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes. That it says that, and, and we saw in chapter 7 of Romans, that we are dead to the law, and we're married to another, Christ. So we don't go to church on Sunday. Last time in chapter 13, in verse 9, we saw that Paul uh, quoted five of the Ten Commandments. He left out the other five on purpose. And one of them that he left out was, remember the Sabbath day. Why? Why did Paul forget that one? Because today, we don't have to remember the Sabbath day. We're no longer under the law. We regard Sunday 
as the day of the Son, Jesus Christ, the day he resurrected, so we go to church on Sunday. Now most of these people on this side say, well you can't find that in the Bible. Yes you can. I have a video on YouTube called, Why Church on Sunday? And I show at least three verses where the early church met on the first day of the week. So if we are Seventh-day Adventists, we have to believe that the church started with a bunch of heretics that took the mark of the beast because they're meeting on Sunday. Crazy. That's why this is something that shouldn't be a contention. Yet they, the Seventh-day Adventists, try to be contentious. And they're doing the opposite of what the Bible teaches. And then it says there in verse 6, He that eateth to the Lord, for the Lord giveth thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So again, vegan versus meat. Don't make it a point of contention. It's no big deal. Um, now let's go to verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. So what does that mean? That means what you do in the, this life, somebody else is going to be watching. And you've got to make up your mind. Am I going to stop doing what I'm doing to please them? Or am I going to do what I'm doing because it's right? Well, I'm not going to stop eating meat to please these people over here that are vegans. I'll just say, if you believe that, help yourself. But when you attack me and say, you're wrong, you're a heretic, you meat eater, then we have a problem. You are taking something too dogmatic. When I come to church on Sunday and this guy screams, you, you got the mark of the beast, then we've got a problem. He's being too dogmatic. So Paul is writing to this church and telling them, look, don't fight. Let one do what he wants, let the other guy do what he wants. What you should really do is follow the scriptures, which is church on Sunday. <clears throat> it says, verse 8, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. I believe it's in Philippians where it says, To live is Christ, and to die is gain. So if we are the Lord's, we should live unto the Lord. What does that mean? We should, for ourselves, look in the Bible and find out which is the right way, and then go in that way. And not fight. We should just simply say, brother, I believe this. If you believe differently, then help yourself. But my conscience tells me I can eat meat. My conscience tells me church on Sunday. So there it is. Verse 9. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. So Jesus Christ died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. So right there in the middle of the passage, we have the death, burial, and resurrection. There's the gospel. Thank you, Paul, for asserting that right there in the text. Christ died, was buried, and rose again. What for? He died for everybody. That means Jesus Christ died for those that believe in eating meat. It's just as much as he died for those that don't believe in eating meat. He says here, verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now what is the judgment seat of Christ? We've looked at this before. There are two judgments in the Bible. Well, there actually are seven. And we'll look at those one day, the seven judgments. But there are two main judgments in the Bible. The two main judgments in the Bible are the great white throne of judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. This is for all lost people. This is for all saved people. So when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died and he judged the sins of the world. Now the Bible teaches that after the rapture takes place, and here's the tribulation period. Here's Armageddon over here. And here's the millennial kingdom. The Bible teaches us that the judgment seat of Christ is what God does after the rapture, and all who are saved and go at the rapture, that's when the judgment seat of Christ takes place. And what it is, is God looking at what you did for Him. And what you did for Jesus, you'll get rewards. What you did for yourself will burn up. So that is for saved people, and it's not for your sins. He's not going to throw in your face your sins ever again. They're under the blood. It'll only be for your service. And Jesus will say, now what did you do for me in this life? And the things that you did for me... You get gold, silver, precious stones. That's the judgment seat of Christ that Paul's talking about here in verse 10. Now over here, at the end of the millennial kingdom, God's going to take and destroy everything, and then God's going to set up the great white throne of judgment, and everybody that's over here in hell will be 
brought up before God and judged and stand before an almighty holy God and be judged for everything they ever did. Now, in 1 Corinthians, we talked a little bit about the judgment seat of Christ. There are three verses in the Bible that talk about the judgment seat of Christ. So the judgment seat of Christ has three verses connected with it. first one here is Romans 14 and verse 10, I believe it is. The second one is 2 Corinthians. I don't have time to go through this because, like I said, we've talked about it already in our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through um, the epistles of Paul. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is the last time. 1 Corinthians. So check out these three verses if you want to learn more about the judgment seat of Christ. Otherwise, go to um, the 1 Corinthians teaching of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study and look at this. And it looks like it's verse 10 through 15. So these are the verses that talk about the judgment seat of Christ. Now, what are the verses that talk about the uh, great white throne of judgment. Well, that's found in Revelation. And I think we want verse... Well, it's either chapter 14 or 15. I guess it's 15. Let's see here. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's over in chapter four, uh, 20. Yeah, it's Revelation chapter 20. Okay. Revelation chapter 20 tells us what will take place at this judgment for all the lost people that are in hell. Revelation 20, in verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, whose face, from whose face the heaven and the earth fled away, and there was no, found no more place for them. So this is the great white throne of judgment, because Jesus is sitting on a great white throne. And it says in verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So at this judgment, everyone that gets out of hell will be judged and then cast into the lake of fire. There's nobody that's lost that will be saved in this judgment, it seems like. They will all have to give account to a God for what they've done in this life according to their works. Why would God judge them according to their works? Well, because they've rejected the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so God says, well, if you don't accept what I did for you, let's look at what you did in your life. And so everything they've ever done, every fornication, every lie, every murder, every sin of lust in their heart will be shown in front of an almighty, righteous, holy God. And boy, will they be embarrassed. Boy, I'm, I'm so glad I'm saved so I don't have to do that, stand before God and give account of every work I've ever done. So that's what that is. That's the, the great white throne of judgment. So there's two different judgments, and we've talked about the judgment seat of Christ before. These are the verses and how it takes place and where it takes place. So go back to chapter 14. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The context is brethren, save people. So the judgment seat of Christ is save people. Verse 11, he quotes Isaiah 45:23. It says, For as it is written... As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Someday we'll stand before God and give account to him. As it is written, every knee shall bow. So now he's gone from just the judgment seat of Christ, but at the great white throne of judgment too, every knee shall bow and confess what that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Uh, verse 12, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God, saved at the judgment seat of Christ, lost at the great white throne of judgment. Verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. It goes back to everything we've looked at, how there was two groups, and this one judging this one, and this one judging that one. He says, stop. Don't do that. Don't judge each other. Well, in Christianity today, what do we have? A lot of Christians judging other Christians, and they shouldn't do it. We're told right here not to 
judge one another anymore. So what you do as a Christian is your business, but that's between you and God. Well, there are some things that you do that are probably sin that you shouldn't do, but it's not my place to tell you to do it or not do it. My place is to preach the Word of God, to preach against sin, and hope that the Holy Spirit of God convicts you of your sin so that you'll get right. You know, I've heard people say, well, the preacher preached against my sin. I felt so bad I went down and got right because he told me I was doing wrong. What's wrong with that? Well, the person is looking at the preacher and wanting to do right based upon what the preacher says. They're looking at the preacher as the final authority. That's wrong. Yeah, great if they get right, but it's the wrong. It should be, God says this, and a person feels so bad in their heart that they're sinning against God that they get right, because the Bible says so. There's a lot of preachers in this world that have exalted themselves up almost to, the, to where they think they are God. And people look at them and worship them. There's a big church up north that they worship the pastor. He's dead now. But they worship him almost to the point as though he was like, a God or something. That's sick. Never worship a pastor. Worship Jesus. And listen to what the Bible says. Get right. Yes, preach against sins. Preach hard against sin. But preach it so hard and so right that people realize they're sinning against God, not the pastor. Not the pastor. A lot of people, they're well-meaning. They want to please the pastor. That's wonderful. But I tell you what, and any pastor I know would tell you the exact same thing. If you are pleasing God, you'll be pleasing the pastor. That's the way it works. If you are truly pleasing God the way you live and doing right, the pastor will be pleased too because he sees that in you. All right, so verse uh, 13, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. All right, so if someone says, well, this is unclean to me, okay, then to him it is unclean. Verse 15, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Now what's the meat? Well, he's writing to Rome where there's a lot of Gentiles, so putting two to two together, it's probably pork because that is one of the meats that Jews did not eat. Now remember, when you're saved, you're no longer a Jew or a Gentile, you're part of the church of God. So when you're saved, you can eat pork. So there's no problem with that. But why would we as Christians grieve other Christians? It's like this. I know a brother that, that hates meat and he only eats vegan style. And I invite him over to the house and I make him a little salad and I sit over here with my pork sausage and go, Mmm, this is so good. Mmm, you don't know what you're missing out. Oh, honey, oh, the steak's ready. Mmm, look at this ribeye. You don't know what you're... See how I'm trying to make him angry? <laughs> and at the same time, I'm pulling him down because I'm saying, you're so dumb because you think you can't eat this, and God said I could, and look how good it is. It's like I'm mocking him almost. And that's something we don't want to do. That's putting a stumbling block uh, in, in his way. Now, can he eat meat? Yes! There's no sin to eat meat if we sanctify it with the Word of God in prayer. That's what the Bible teaches. So, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. What will that do? That will make him angry and bitter and hate me for being like that to him. And that could destroy him. Verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken of. So do good, but don't let anybody say that, that it's evil. Because, you know, if I did that, that guy would go tell other Christians, that guy, that breaker, he's so horrible. He's, he knows that I don't like eating meat, and then he eats it in front of me, just to make me angry. Well, was I doing good? Well, it's not wrong to eat meat. But he can speak evil of me because, yeah, I was making fun of him and mocking him. <laughs> so let's don't do that. Respect. It all boils down to one word. Respect one another. Esteem one another more highly than yourselves. Verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, we looked at this before. There's two kingdoms in the Bible. And I've got a video on this. It's called the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. And uh, I like to abbreviate it, the K-O-G and the K-O-H. Now there's a famous YouTube preacher that makes fun of this and says, Oh, they're no difference. They're the same thing. Ha, ha, ha. And he made his little video on it and he tried to prove that they're the same. Well, 
And he claims to have looked up every verse in the Bible. Well, he didn't see this one. Because this says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So it's not meat and drink. It's not something physical. It's what? It's something spiritual. So the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. So he, to this day, does not see the difference between the two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But the Bible clearly teaches the difference. And the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Watch this. Go to Luke chapter 17 and verse 21. Luke 17, 21. By the way, this guy is the guy that says, there's no such thing as dispensations. Okay. How do you rightly divide the word of truth if there's nothing to divide? Okay. Why does the Bible say God at sundry times and in a diverse manner spoke to the prophets? That's different ways, different times, dealing in different styles. That's dispensations. Anyway, Luke 17 and verse 21. The Bible says, well, I've got to start at verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, here or there, lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom within you. What is the kingdom of God today? It's the church age. When you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside you. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. This is the kingdom of God. Now, what is the kingdom of heaven? It's a physical kingdom. And as you look at a lot of Old Testament verses that talk about the kingdom when Jesus comes, and you look at this kingdom of heaven, this is the kingdom of heaven. It's a kingdom when Jesus literally appears after Armageddon six sets up his millennial kingdom. It's the opposite of a spiritual kingdom. It's a physical kingdom. To learn more about that, a lot of good verses about that, go to YouTube and look up my video about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. That's all I'm going to say about that right now. Verse 18 says, For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of man. What are these things? Well, these things are not destroying your brother, not putting a stumbling block, verse 13, and respecting or esteeming or regarding um, them more highly than yourself. So, treat other Christians with respect. One thing I've noticed, well, let me say this. When I went to Bible school, the founder of that Bible school, the first thing he said on the first day that we started Bible school was, people that will hurt you most in the ministry are other Christians. And we all looked at each other and said, I don't believe that. Christians are great people. They love each other. We were so naive. You know what we found? That the people who hurt you most in the ministry are other Christians, usually other pastors, who don't listen to Romans 14 who judge others and attack them and yell and scream at them and holler and make fun of them and mock them. Yeah, I've, I've been through that in my life. I've known Christians that I love, that I prayed for, that I would do anything for, turn on me, call me names, make little YouTube videos about me, or uh, make little websites and lie and call me names. Where's that in the Bible? It's not there. Where's the love? It's not there. Notice that when I preach, I try my best not to name names. I don't want to name call, or I don't want to mention another brother in a bad light, because I don't want to hurt him or his ministry. I never would want to hurt him and his ministry. Yet there are many that attack and say, this breaker guy, he's this, 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 and he's this, and he's so dumb, and he's this. You do what you want to do. You'll give account to God at the judgment seat of Christ, and there'll be a whole lot of smoke there, because you disobeyed chapter 14, where it says we're not supposed to judge other brothers. We're supposed to do right and live right. So I want to deal with the issue, with the doctrine. If there's something that a man preaches that's wrong, let's deal with the doctrine. Let's look at the Bible and see that it's wrong. But I'm not going to attack him in his name. I don't want to name call as a Christian. You know what that does? turns people off. Lost people look at that and say, he's not a Christian. Christians aren't supposed to do that. I mean, they're smarter than Christians, a lot of lost people. Because they see Christians fighting and attacking and name calling, and they say, well, that's not Christian. Well, how come the actual Christians that are doing it don't see that? <laughs> I don't understand. But anyway, <clears throat> verse 18, For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of man. Verse 19, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. And that's what I want to do in my ministry. I want peace, and I want to edify other Christians. That's why I've had to separate myself over the years from certain people. Because all those people do is attack and ridicule and mock and, and name call and put down. And that is not Christian. 
I don't care what they say. You look at the fruits of the Spirit, and that's not one of them. They're not there. The way many Christians act are the exact opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. And I want nothing of it. I want to be edified. I want peace. I want Christians fighting together against the world and the flesh and the devil instead of fighting against each other. I want to see Christians in the fight, the spiritual battle for right, rather than battling each other. So, which things make after peace, and things therefore one may edify another. What is edify? To build up. Yet many Christians, all they try to do is tear down, destroy, stumble, make other Christians stumble. That's why it says stumbling block. So we're supposed to edify one another. Now verse 20, remember the context of this is still about eating meat versus eating herbs, eating, eating greens, vegan versus meat. Verse 20, for me destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. So that little story that I gave you, if I was sitting over here with my kielbasa and I invited this guy over that I knew was a vegan and he was a Christian, I was like, mm -hmm, you're sure missing out. Mm -hmm, what is that? It is evil for me to try to offend him on purpose. So I shouldn't do that. If I love a brother and yet he has that conviction of I don't eat meat, and I invite him over to my house, I say, well, brother, we're eating this today. I hope it doesn't offend you, but we've made you a nice salad. We're just here to have your company, have some fellowship with you. And I'm sorry if you don't believe it's right for us to eat this, but this is what we as a family do. I hope you respect us as we respect you. That's how you deal with Christians. All right. Verse 22, 21. It is good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine nor anything whereby that brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Well, I guess it's saying there that we shouldn't even have meat. We should invite the brother over and we'll just eat salad too. <laughs> when he's gone, we'll go, okay, bring out the meat, you know. But it all boils down to this. Are you judging the guy and are you trying to offend him on purpose? God looks at your heart and God sees that. And God hates that. When another Christian tries to offend or, or ridicule or put down or provoke to wrath another Christian. God hates that. You see, we're all the children of God when we're saved. We should get along. When you've got kids, you don't like to see your kids fight each other. I mean, that's why most parents are like, stop it, shut up, quiet, be quiet, don't do that, don't do that. You know, because you want to see peace. Peace is a wonderful thing. Verse 21. It is, ne it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby that brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. So all this goes back to what I said. What if you drink wine like they do over in Europe? And a brother comes and he's against drinking wine. Well then, when we invite him to that meal, we don't drink any wine. Now they drink it over in Europe. We in America, most churches, most Christians say, we don't do that, we don't do that. Okay. And verse um, 20. Two, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Now notice what he says right here. You are happy when you don't go around condemning people. There's some happiness and some joy. You know what that tells us? That these people who claim to be Christians that go around and mock and ridicule and make fun and name call, they are not happy people. They don't have the fruits of the Spirit. You've got to wonder sometimes if they're even saved. Now, it's hard for me to say that. I went to a Bible school where it was one of the greatest Bible teachers the world's ever known. But he is the least friendly person the world's ever known. <laughs> he, he, if you say his name, they say, oh, I don't like him. He's so negative. He, just, he says mean things all the time. That's what most people think. Well, I don't care how he talks. I just want to learn the Bible. And man, he knows the Bible. Man, what a great Bible teacher. But there's a lot to be said about being nice. You know, if you're happy... That happiness shows. There's another brother that I remember in Christ that died not too long ago. And uh, he came to Honduras and visited me. He was a great evangelist. He was in Vietnam and flew airplanes. And afterwards, he started a ministry going all over the world and distributing Bibles and getting Bibles all over the world. And there's one thing about that brother that I'll never forget. is I never saw him without a smile on his face. Every time I saw that brother, I was always, Hey, brother, how you doing? He was so happy. His whole life, he was just smile, smile, smiles. He was a happy man. Well, how do you think he treated others? 
with respect and joy and peace and love because he was so happy. So if you see a Christian who all he does is go around and judge and condemn others, then according to this verse, you know one thing about him, he's not happy. God didn't call us to judge others and attack and put them down and ridicule and then call. And if you see someone doing that, you know he's not a happy person. He doesn't have the joy of the Lord. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, last verse, verse 23. This is a good verse. There's a church here in town. This is one of their favorite verses, and they preach this verse. But they preach it out of context quite often. You've seen the context. The context is that of eating something that you're not sure that you should eat. Verse 23 says, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so they'll take that and they say, you're damned if you don't believe. Well, that's right. That's a little bit of a twisting of the verse, but how are you saved? You're saved by believing. So if there's no believing and you're doubting, or you doubt that you're saved, then you probably weren't saved to begin with, is what they teach. And so, well, I understand that the principle, doubt is the opposite of faith. If you doubt, then you're not saved. If you believe, then you are saved. But can a person who is truly saved doubt they're saved? Yeah, for maybe a minute or two. But the more they think about it, the more they read the Bible, the more they realize, that was dumb. I am saved because I'm trusting what Jesus did for me. Uh, for such people, there's 1 John 5.13. For these things have I written that you may know that you have eternal life. But um, the end of this verse says, For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So even though the context is about eating or not eating, it says a principle that is true. It's important to believe. Faith is part of the Christian life. You have to have faith. You have to believe. It's important. But it says, But he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever not of faith is sin. Now people say, Well, he's damned. That means he's going to hell. Not always. There's a physical damnation and a spiritual damnation. A person that's damned to hell is damned to hell to burn all eternity their soul. But there is a, a damnation of a Christian. You can be damned in the sense that you can be... Well, let me, let me look at a cross verse. 1 Timothy 5.11. And try to show you. You can, you can mess up your ministry. Let's put it that way. Your ministry can be damned, if you will. You can ruin your ministry by offending others and not doing right. 1 Timothy 5, verse 11 and 12 says... But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. And who is he talking about? He's talking about the younger widows in the faith, Christian women. And then it says, against Christ they will marry, having damnation, because they cast off their first faith. He's talking about a Christian woman marrying a lost man. And she's having damnation. Well, if she's truly saved, she can't go to hell. So what will the damnation be? Well, the damnation will be the rest of her life in the flesh. She's damned because she's dating and marrying someone who's not a Christian. She's going to have problems. So every time the Bible says damnation, it's not always talking of the soul. You have to look at the context. And the context of Romans chapter 14 has been brethren, has been Christians, has been people who are saved. So, verse 23 says, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. What does that mean? That means physically, not spiritually. He cannot lose his salvation and go to hell. Because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So we have here a, a damnation in the sense that he's damned in the flesh, but not in the spirit, not the soul. I hope I can explain that well enough. Um, sometimes Paul says some things that are hard to understand. And you just got to read it and read it and read it. So there's Romans chapter 14. Um, this chapter has been some guidelines that Paul gives us. And briefly they are, consider your influence, verse 7. You should consider the influence that you have on others. Consider a weaker brother, verse 13. There are Christians that are weaker than you, and you need to edify them and lift them up instead of trying to push them down and put them down. Consider others' impressions or what other people think, verse 16. Consider the judgment, verse 10 and 12. All this ties into judgment seat of Christ. How you treat other Christians will, will show up here. 
I mean, if you spend your whole life and your whole ministry attacking and name-calling and putting others down, you think you'll get anything in heaven for that? You think you'll get any gold, silver, precious stones? Or do you think you'll get so much uh, smoke in heaven that God will have to open the windows? You see, a lot of Christians don't understand what it is to be a Christian. Being a Christian just doesn't mean you're saved from hell. It's a lifestyle. But it's also it's a, it's a way you treat others as well. And you're supposed to treat others with dignity, with respect, and love. And you're supposed to edify, lift them up, rather than going around putting them down all the time. <clears throat> you should also consider if there are any doubts in what you are doing. Verse 23. When you do something as a Christian, you need to stop thinking. And when I do this, what will other people think? You know, I know this isn't wrong to do, but what will others think about it? What if I, God forbid, but what if I went out and bought a six-pack of beer and I came home and drank it? Is that a sin? Well, as long as I don't get drunk, I guess not. But what if I did that and some folks came over to visit me? <laughs> well, then I'm <laughs> in a pickle. I don't want to see other people see me doing that. So it would be best for me to stay away from it completely so that I don't have to worry about people seeing me do that. So there we have chapter 14 of Romans. I hope it's been a blessing. I hope I've been able to explain it. It was mostly about how one Christian deals with and feels toward another Christian. It had a lot to do a bit about eating herbs or eating meat or drinking wine or not drinking wine. It had a lot to do with how you should teach and edify other Christians instead of putting them down. And how your attitude should be and how you should act toward other Christians. Don't ridicule and mock and, and, and make fun of them and judge them. Because that might offend them. I'll tell you, let me give you an example. I went to a church one time and uh, there was a guy with a couple sons at this church and everybody in the church wore a tie. But this guy, for some reason, loved a bow tie. And so he always dressed himself and his sons in just a little bow tie. You know, you know, a little bow tie right there. Well, he had his little bow tie, and his sons did. And uh, he was a neat guy. And I was just visiting that church, but we got to talking, and I enjoyed talking with him. He was the kind of guy, you know, you just want to have fellowship with. And I was watching him, and this church that I was in was connected with a really big Bible school, Bible Institute. And so there were all these Bible students walking around, all dressed perfectly with their perfect ties and everything. As a matter of fact, they looked like a bunch of robots. They were all dressed the same. They all acted the same. All talked the same. It was kind of, it's kind of discouraging. I mean, everybody's an individual. They don't have to all act and look the same. But um, <clears throat> anyway, I was talking to him, and then these couple of Bible Institute or Bible College kids came over, and they said, "Hey, brother, so and so, what you doing with your bow tie?" And they began to mock and make fun of this brother because he was wearing a bow tie. And make fun of his kids who were wearing a bow tie. And I was watching this and I had a bad feeling. I'm like, these are Bible school students? They're so full of pride. I just want to, I felt like I just want to punch them in the face. Because they're making fun of this poor guy who's a real nice Christian brother. And I said, brother, what is this? He goes, oh, they, they razz me all the time, he said. I said, yeah, but why? I mean... That we have liberty in Christ to wear whatever we want. <laughs> so why do you put up with this crap? He goes, oh, they, they think they're so funny. He goes, I, I've learned to deal with it. They don't know what they're talking about. And then they came back in greater numbers. And they began to say, hey, there's the brother with the bow tie. Ha, ha, ha. And you know what he did? He walked right up to him and said, who's got a dime? I mean, he said, who's got a nickel and who's got a penny? And they were, there. what? He goes, show me a penny and show me a nickel. So they looked in their pockets, they pull it out, he said, give it to me. He goes, who is this guy on the penny? They said, Abraham Lincoln. He says, what is he wearing? They said, <clears throat> a bow tie. He goes, if it's good enough for a president, it's good enough for me. Look here, here's a nickel. Who's this guy? They said, Thomas Jefferson. He says, what's he wearing? A bow tie. He says, there you go. If it's good enough for a president, it's good enough for me. Now you boys leave me alone. And they walked away. I watched them. They kind of walked away like that. <laughs> That's how you deal with people like that, I guess. But that's the attitude. Those so-called Bible students, so-called Christians, all they wanted to do was attack. Oh, he's not like us. Get him, get him, get him. And he luckily was so strong in the faith that it didn't bother him. He just said, look at that. If it's good enough for a president, it's good enough for me. Now, no, just move along. Just move along. <clears throat> just brush it off. Just have a nice day. 
So, that was interesting. So that kind of ties in with what we're talking about here. Why were they judging him for wearing a bow tie? What does it matter? It, it really, in the scheme of things, for all eternity, what does it matter if you wore a regular tie or a bow tie? Who cares? Well, they tried to make it a point of contention. And that's the problem today, is that there are many Christians who want to make certain things points of contention that mean nothing. I preached a, a message not too long ago, the gap theory. And then I really call it a gap theory. If you get a chance, go to YouTube, look up the gap theory. There are many Christians that want to know if you believe that or not, just so they can say, well, if you believe that, I can't have fellowship with you, so, huh. So I preached the message in such a way that I said, well, here's the three ideas on it. So you can either accept one of them for yourself, if you think so, as you study the Bible, or forget it. But there's no reason to be contentious about it. And that's the problem with many Christians today, is they don't look for other Christians to have fellowship with them. They look for other Christians so they can nitpick them and say, now what's wrong with you so I can't have fellowship with you? And I don't want to be around people like that, to be quite honest with you. My dad used to call himself a hermit. He went to just about every church in this area, around where I live, Pensacola, Milton, all these areas, Pace. I believe one of these, just about every Baptist church in this area, my dad at one time taught Sunday school. They would always ask my dad to come and teach Sunday school, and my dad, he had a 20-foot long Bible chart that was like that long, and it was 20 feet wide. It was an amazing thing. I still have it back there. And he would put it on the wall, and it would actually take about three walls in the little Sunday school room where he was, take, where he was preaching. And my dad would start at the beginning, and he would teach dispensational truth, and he would show people, this is how God dealt with people in different times. This was the law. We are no longer under the law, we're under grace. And this is salvation, and he pointed to the gospel. My dad told me that after a while, the people started learning so much Bible that the pastor would get jealous. Because most of the pastors didn't know it, didn't understand it, didn't believe it. And they'd say, Breaker, you have to leave because I'm, I'm scared that the people want you as pastor rather than me. <laughs> and that's sad. My dad didn't want to be a pastor. He just wanted people to learn the Bible just like me. But my dad, after going to all those churches and teaching and seeing all the, the, the sad awfulness in those churches, my dad almost became a hermit because he saw that very few of those churches preached the gospel correctly. I could tell you stories. One church, a gigantic church right across the bay in Pensacola. My dad taught the Sunday school and the pastor's brother and the pastor's father were in that Sunday school. My dad told me a story about how they got so angry they turned beet red and began yelling at my dad saying, What do you mean it's not salvation by works? It's by works that you're saved. You've got to do works or you'll go to hell. And they stormed out the door. The very pastor's family, his father and brother, are lost and on their way to hell. Thinking that they're saved by works. And yet they've been sitting 20, 30, 40 years in the very church that their relative preaches in. How come he never preached the gospel? How come, how come they don't understand? Well, if he was a preacher and he preached the gospel, then they should have realized that and gotten saved, right? So my dad got discouraged. He quit going to church. Quite often he'd just stay home and read the Bible. He became a little bit of a hermit. And I don't blame him, because churches nowadays, they are really going against God and the Bible. They're forgetting to preach the blood. They're forgetting to preach the gospel. They're forgetting to preach the truth. But you know, it would be easy for me to get discouraged too. I mean, it would be really easy for me to attack and name call and put them down. But how does that help the cause of Christ? How does that help them? We read here that what I'm supposed to do as a Christian is what? Let me look at verse 19 again. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith we may edify another. I look at my ministry as trying to edify others. I want to lift them up. I want to teach them the gospel, show them the way, show them how to be saved, and how to live as a Christian, how to understand and read correctly, rightly divide the word of truth. You know, it would be easy for me to be a hermit because I see churches getting worse and worse and worse. They don't preach the gospel anymore. They don't preach rightly dividing the word of truth anymore. I could just say, forget it all. Let's just go fishing. But I can't do that. God's called me to try to at least stand in these last days for the truth. And that's what I want to do. So that's chapter 14 of Romans. A lot more that I could say. I hope this has been uh, encouraging and edifying to you. And uh, 
I hope it helps you with your attitude as a Christian. We shouldn't attack and put down other Christians. We should take them and say, look, have you ever seen this in the Bible? Let's have a Bible study. Let me show you some things that you might not have ever seen in the Bible. And either they'll accept it or reject it. What if they don't? Well, the Bible says we have to separate from others. There are some times when we as Christians have to separate from other Christians because they refuse to do right, refuse to live right, refuse to teach right. So we say, okay, have a nice day. We'll see you in heaven. But there are many other Christians out there, many, who don't know the truth. And they're just waiting for someone to take them under the wing and say, let me teach you something from the Bible. And that's what we're supposed to do. So I'm going to close there. Next time we will talk about chapter 15 of Romans, an amazing chapter, a chapter which shows two very distinct and different ministers. And I guess you could say two different ministries. And we'll get into that and show the difference between the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of Paul. And if you want to, go to YouTube and check it out. I have a video called Jesus versus Paul. And maybe that will explain a little bit. Maybe you'll be, be prepared if you watch that video before next time. But next time we will go into that and I will show you the difference between Jesus who came only to Jews and Paul who God called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Now he went to Jews too. But Jesus went only to Jews. And uh, the Jews rejected him as their Messiah. And that's why we... Dirty, low-down, sorry Gentiles, I'm including myself, I'm not name-calling someone else, I'm, I'm one of them too. Uh, we can be saved today because the Jews, the Israel, the nation rejected their Messiah. So let's stop there. We'll see you next time on cloudchurch.org. God bless.